morning. And happy Father's Day. Last time I was here, I said happy Mother's Day. Did I do that on purpose? This morning when I walked out of my apartment, guess what I smelled? A bunch of barbecue. It's only appropriate. Dad's breaking out the grill. Every dad's breaking out the grill. I'm sure it's going to look like it's just a big cloud of smoke over my apartment complex with all the dads that are grilling today. And so I had told my dad over the phone, happy Father's Day, and he said he was going to break out the grill after he gets out of church also. I'm not a dad, so I'll be going to get the usual tacos on Sunday afternoon instead, which I'm probably just as excited about. If you know a good taco place, let us know. We also have a great father, our Heavenly Father. And I mean, I'm going to be very vulnerable with you right now, and that is that Father's Day is almost one of the easiest days to preach on because it's a direct connection. We have a good father, and we're happy about our good father, and our father has been very, very good to us. So happy Father's Day to those on earth, but also remember how good our heavenly father has been to us all of this time. And if you, if you look at our scripture reading here in Psalm 116, our psalmist here kind of capitalizes on that directly. Uh, we, we could go all the way back to the beginning, um, which, which I might do later, but for now we're going to kind of cut this sort of in half and, and look at verse 12. Listen to how this psalmist is so happy about our God, about our Father. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord and the presence of all his people. That sounds like somebody that's pretty happy. For everything that the Lord has done for me, what, what can I give back to God? All he does benefits me. I will lift up the cup of my salvation. I accept this salvation. And I'll call on the name of the Lord. Who else can give it but one Father? I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. That's somebody that's pretty excited to pay their vows. He wants everybody to know. Verse 15, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your maidservant. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. Here it is again. I will pay my vows to the Lord and the presence of all his people. In the court of the house of the Lord in your midst, O Jerusalem, praise the Lord. This is somebody that's excited about their relationship with God. Somebody that's excited about paying their vows in front of everybody else. Somebody that recognizes what God has done for them all this time and ends it. Praise the Lord. When was the last time you were this excited about praising the Lord? What does it take for you to get so excited when you recognize all that God has done for you and you want to call on his name and you're excited to go and, and, and pay your vows? And you say, I, I know who gave me the salvation. I know whose name I call upon. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. When was the last time you were this excited about praising the Lord like this psalmist right here? You'll notice there's kind of some repetition in this psalm here where we have twice salvation. We have, we have multiple times uh, a praise the Lord and, and a big thanksgiving, but also in there twice. Verse 14, verse 18. I will pay my vows to the Lord and the presence of all his people. Now, vows are interesting because in the Jewish world, you were committed to God. And then on top of that, if you explore Leviticus and Numbers, you could vow something to the Lord. You would make a vow to the Lord. And the most holy vow is the Nazarite vow that you can find in Numbers. That was something that was really set aside and took a lot of commitment. And the idea of vows to us today is a little bit interesting in vowing something to the Lord. And it was very familiar 
to the psalmist and to the Old Testament. The vows that we might explore today that we can relate a lot to is the vows of marriage. Now, I have been married for a long zero years. And so I have a whole lot of zero advice to give you on marriage whatsoever. But I have examples of what it's like to have been married from my dad. And my dad was very serious about his vows to my mom. And he taught that to both of my sisters, who are both now married and have said their vows, and they're very serious about their vows. And the advice that my dad would give to me, even at a young age, he would always give me two pieces of advice about marriage. And the first one is, if you don't run track and if you're not really fast, then you're never going to get married. And the second one was, it's always about the other person. Marriage is about the other person. It's not 50-50. It's all about the other person. And do you remember when you said your vows? Do you remember what was in those vows? In sickness and in health, for better, for worse, till death do us part. And that's exactly what my father meant. And that's exactly what both of my sisters meant. And that's something I've never said. But I understand the severity of a vow all the way to the end of your life something that was such an example and that you probably completely understand. You have that over me. I don't understand that yet. You have that advantage over me. Our vows here, verse 14 and 18. I will pay my vows in the presence of all his people. I want to honor my vows to the Lord. I want it to be all about the Lord, what I've committed to him. Everything that I've committed to the Lord, I want to pay, and I want everybody to know that I'm excited about paying it. And everything around verse 14 and 18, look what God has done for me. Look what he did toward me. What can I give to the Lord for all of his benefits to, to me? I will call on the name of the Lord. Let's look at a different vow that took place. If we flip back all the way to the book of Judges, Judges chapter 11 and verse 29, we have a specific vow that was made by a father. And if you have headings in your Bible like I have in mine, it kind of spoils the whole story. So just try not to look at that real quick. We'll get to that in a second. But let's look at Japheth's vow. Not Japheth, excuse me, Jephthah's vow. Rearrange the letters a little bit. Jephthah's vow starts in verse 29, but a little bit of backstory about Jephthah is he was the son of a prostitute and he had a father that was married. And so he had a bunch of stepbrothers that didn't like him. And so his stepbrothers didn't want him to have an inheritance since he wasn't part of the biological line of their mother. And so they, they kind of shoo Jephthah off. And Jephthah starts running with the wrong crowd and has his own life kind of apart from things. But then the elders of his own tribe, of the Gileites, came and bring Jephthah back. And they say, we need you to lead this army. We have a job for you. And Jephthah agrees to do it. And then he's going to go to war against the Amorites, or excuse me, the Ammonites. I'm mixing a lot of words up. The Ammonites. And so in verse 29, we come to Jephthah as he's getting ready to go to war with the Ammonites. Verse 29, then the spirit of the Lord was upon Jephthah, and he passed through Gilead and Manasseh and passed on top of Mizpah of Gilead. And of Mizpah of Gilead, he passed on to the Ammonites. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, if you will give the Ammonites into my hand, then whatever comes out from the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the Ammonites 
shall be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. And this is kind of a controversial passage because it almost sounds like Jephthah's trying to, trying to buy the favor of the Lord. You give me this, I will give you a burnt offering, whatever you want. But a lot, this is not the case. A lot of scholars and a lot of commentators focus in on this piece right here and say this is not somebody trying to buy the favor of the Lord. This is not purchasing a favor from God. And on the other hand, I mean, how many times have we kind of been in this sort of a situation? Lord, if you get me out of this, I will never do this again. If you help me pass this test, I will, I will read my Bible for seven hours a day. This is actually not that at all. And if, if there's something that we know about God, it's that he actually doesn't need anything from us. I'll read for you real quick Psalm 50. Psalm 50 in verse 12 again says, If I were hungry, I would not tell you. This is, this is of the Lord speaking. If I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you. For the world and its fullness are mine. Do I eat the flesh of fools and drink the blood of goats? Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and perform your vows to the Most High. And call upon me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. God doesn't need anything. You can't buy God with something that's already his and the whole world is his. But this is what God says. This is what the Most High says. You're in trouble, you call on me. And you'll glorify me. You make a vow, you pay your vow to the Most High. Offer to God a thanksgiving sacrifice. With this in mind, we move back to Judges chapter 11. And verse 31, whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the Ammonites shall be yours, Lord, and I will offer it up as a burnt offering. This is more like a Thanksgiving offering. Jephthah's here in this situation where he's about to go to war with the whole nation, and he's the leader. And to his credit, he recognizes, I can't do this alone. I can't do this on my own strength which takes a lot for somebody to admit, for somebody to say. I don't have all the power to do this. And so, just like the Psalms say, he calls on the name of the Lord. Lord, if you'll deliver the Ammonites into my hand, I will offer up a burnt offering to you, whatever comes out of my door. This is almost like a, a blank check of thanksgiving. Father, what you want, I will gladly give it to you. And I'm calling on you for this help. You can't really blame Jephthah for this sort of a thing. I need help, I call on the Lord, and I will give the Lord his thanks, whatever he desires. And in verse 32, we see the fulfillment of this. So Jephthah crossed over to the Ammonites to fight against them, and the Lord gave them into his hand. And he struck them from Arior to the neighborhood of Manith, 20 cities as far as Abel Karim, and a great blow so the Ammonites were subdued before the people of Israel. This sounds more like when the Lord comes through, he really comes through. Verse 34, Then Jephthah came to his home at Mizpah, and behold, his daughter came out to meet him with tambourines and with dances. She was the only child. Besides her, he had neither son nor daughter. And as soon as he saw her, he tore his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, you have brought me very low, and you have become the cause of great trouble for me. And then he exposes his vow. My vow was, whatever came out of my house first would be my offering to the Lord. And here comes his one and only daughter. She's coming out with tambourines. She's dancing. She's really happy for her dad. And dad's come back from a pretty great victory. One commentator says about this, and few people say it just as good 
as him. And the pulpit commentary says this about this passage. People are often, people are often at a loss for words. When they make a vow to the Lord and then realize all that God demands of them. Not that that man couldn't do it or wasn't expecting to do it, but they don't realize all that God required of them. Do you remember when you were baptized? When you were baptized, you were joined. God. You were committed to God. You will be raised in his likeness. You are the church, the bride of Christ. You're married to God. That was the day when you had vows to the Lord. And it's all about him. He's done everything all about you. And he sent his only child to you. And you vowed and you've committed everything to him. Were you prepared when you were baptized and when you were married to Christ to fulfill everything that he called on you to do. Everything that he required of you. Were you prepared to honor that relationship? And say, I put away other things that will defile this relationship so that I can further be closer to you and do more honoring of this relationship to make it all about you. It requires a lot. But look at everything that he's done for us. Jephthah realized the severity of his vow when something that was required of him was so great. He probably understood what he was getting into when he first made the vow, but then when this is the result of his vow, I'm sure maybe he was having some of those thoughts like, can I take this back? Like, is there an exchange rate on this? What about the second thing that comes out? He exposes his vow, though, and to his fidelity, it looks like he keeps it. Verse 39, and at the end of two months, she returned to her father. She kind of went on a vacation with her friends, a very mourning and wailing vacation. She returned to her father, who did to her according to his vow that he had made. That's a hard thing to do. That's a hard vow to have kept. Also in my unmarried state, I've seen the example of how hard it is to sometimes want to really honor your vow because the other person that you're committed to kind of just kind of hurts you. Never experienced it, only seen it. But I've also seen that they stick with that vow. And they stick with that marriage because they understand this is what I've committed to. And this is what I'm going to continue to do to honor this. Jephthah honored his vow. And every day, God honors his vow to us, his commitment to us, as he has all the way through the Old Testament. Is every day easy for you, knowing that you're committed to the Lord? Or do you realize that in some days you're required to be somebody that honors the Lord and it's not always easy? Every day you have to do things that draw your commitment closer to God. And every day that's not easy. And also, every day you have to put away the things that dishonor that relationship with God. And that vow is not always easy. But it's also not till death do us part. It's 
till death draws us even closer together, as close as we can get. Psalm 116. Let me start from the beginning, this time. And this time, look how much God has done for his people. Look how much God has honored his commitment to mankind. This is what the psalm says. The psalmist says, starting out, Psalm 116, verse 1, I love the Lord because he heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. Because he inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call on him as long as I live. That sounds like a vow to me. The snare of death encompassed me. The pangs of Sheol laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple, and when I was brought low, he saved me. Return. O oh, my soul, to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believed even when I spoke. I am greatly affect, afflicted. I said in my alarm, all mankind are liars. What? shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? What can you give to the Lord for all that he's done for you? What can you render to the Lord that he doesn't already have and couldn't have for himself? In all this world that God has made, what can you give to the Lord for all he's done for you? Especially this one in verse 13, I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. What can you do for the Lord when he gave you salvation? When he gave me salvation? I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. There's only one thing that I really know how to do, realizing all that God has done for me. And that is to give my full worship. What else can I give to the Lord except my whole life and all of me and all of my worship? And if I realize everything that God has done for me, if we look back in this passage and I realize everything that God has done for me, I'm very excited to give to the Lord his praise. That's what motivates us to praise the Lord. I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your maidservant. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. In the court of the house of the Lord, in the midst, O Jerusalem, praise the Lord. Are you motivated to praise the Lord? What motivates you to pay all of your praise and all of your glory to the Lord? Just look back a little bit and you could see why you want to give it all to him. Let me keep this short for you this morning. You were in bonds. You were in distress. You were in shield. But then there was Christ. And when you saw that he offered salvation, you lifted up the cup of salvation. You accepted the cup of salvation and you were baptized. You were joined and you were vowed to Christ for eternity. And what an eternity it's going to be. You haven't made that step yet? I'll offer it to you now. The cup of salvation is waiting for you to take it, and you can be baptized into salvation. But it takes a full commitment. 
it takes a full life-changing commitment and not every day is an easy day. But God is all the way for you, and he wants you to be all the way for him. Always about the other. And if you've been vowed to Christ, and if you've been baptized and married to Christ, and you're in a hard time, I mean, we're here as a family. The church is a body, the bride of Christ. And we're here to help each and every one of you. I feel like I say this every time that I come here, but you have an extensive prayer list. And that's, a, that's exactly how it should be. East Foothills, you know how to care for your own family. And you know who to call upon in the day of distress. And you could be added to that list too if you're in hard time. And we call on the name of the Lord who can only provide everything and so much more. Are you excited about your vow to God? Are you ready to render your praise to him? This morning and every single day. I'll leave the sermon with you this morning.